We're looking at part eight now of the blood vessels in the cardiovascular system. And uh, we're considering such things as blood pressure, blood flow, etc. And uh, here we have a gentleman, a colleague, who is um, engaged in what could be described as um, quick, strenuous activity. Okay, so that's what's uh, being sort of represented here. Uh, we have the total blood flow on one side. We have the total blood flow on another side here with completely different circumstances. And this one over here, we have strenuous exercise. Bear in mind, if this is the um, average gentleman here, then we're looking at um, probably around six or seven uh, pints of blood. Um, and so when we're looking here at milliliters, that would be around 500 is the total uh, at rest the amount of blood that's flowing per minute past a given area or through a system, uh, well, through the entire system in this case, is 5,800 milliliters, 5.8 liters. Okay, so um, let's take a look here and check out where is the blood. Um, the blood in this case is uh, represented at... Uh, let me get this tool over here. The brain having a certain quantity right here, the heart at about one third of that, and uh, the skeletal muscles considerably more, uh, the skin significant, uh, the kidneys is actually kind of surprising if you think of the kidneys size compared to all of the skeletal muscles in the body. The kidneys are actually um, transforming a lot of blood through their activity. The abdominal uh, cavity uh, would be having all of the intestines, etc., and then other things. Notice that the difference here is going to go from um, uh, 5.6 liters to 17.5 liters uh, per minute. So the blood flow is prodigious. Uh, in terms of its change. This is somewhere in the vicinity of three times the change. Where is the change here? If you look at the sort of the biggest, widest change right in through here, they can't even uh, represent it on the page without taking a little snip in the middle of it, is we have 1,200 or 12,500 milliliters uh, compared to, this is the entirety over here at rest, 5,000 we're going to 12,000 just in the musculature, the skeletal muscles. Okay, the skin also is increasing. Note that the uh, skeletal muscles, for one thing, is increasing by a factor of 10. All right, from 1,200 to 12,000. Uh, the skin is going from 500 to 1,500, three times. Uh, there's a decline in the uh, blood flow through the kidneys and through the abdominal region uh, where the digestive tract is. These are important details. The heart is going to be pumping more blood and also seeing more blood just as a tissue itself three times. Notice uh, further that whether you're awake or asleep, dreaming or not dreaming, you have 750 at the brain. You could be strenuously exercising or you could be in deep sleep. There are no differences when it comes to the brain. The brain is functioning full on and not necessarily on behalf of consciousness is, I suppose, the uh, sort of answer to the story here. What is, uh, <laughs> what is the purpose of the brain? Uh, and is consciousness um, more than just practice? Uh, is it really related to anything vital? And, of course, it's the doorway into the practices. But nevertheless, it's the practices, ultimately, that uh, bring you the, uh, how would I say, habits and and set points of the body itself. So behavior, as it were. Okay, so um, we have that interesting uh, detail there that I need you to understand. Um, here's another one that's sort of interesting as well, blood flow velocity uh, versus um, sort of like total cross-sectional area. So we're starting off here with, uh, well, first of all, the area is very small, the aorta. Uh, all of the blood is beginning in the aorta, and it's a, got a very small area. 
sort of balloons for a moment, but then it continues on. And the velocity is pretty significant uh, at that point. Notice that the total volume of where is the blood is really stretched out when we get to the capillaries. We're visiting the 50, 40 or 50 trillion cells uh, doing meals on wheels, etc. So that's a huge, it's like the delta of the Mississippi River. And of course, in the delta of that river as well as here, things slow down quite a bit. And so there's a lot of dynamic exchange going on uh, between the blood and the surrounding tissues, the matrix uh, between the blood and the cells. Okay, and then things pick up again as we move back toward the heart. So there's that issue. Then um, let's take a look here at this next section. Um, here we have blood flow, and how do how does blood flow actually cross over? Um, one of the things that we learned about very early on in 20A was the idea of non-penetrating solutes and what crosses when there are no um, penetrating. They're not really showing us that picture, are they? I suppose perhaps they are here. The idea that um, there could be non-penetrating solutes on this side and the water flows across. We're not going to go there because they're not depicting it very well. Okay, so um, what they are depicting pretty well here is the arterial system over here on this side with an arteriole and the capillary bed and the venule on this side picking it up again. On this side, we have 55 millimeters of mercury, as I just annotated there. And the blood flow is coming in. And notice that the arrows uh, denote that the um, fluid portion of the blood is exiting. We have filtration. That's what that's called. The reason for that is, is that the hydrostatic pressure is 55, and the oncotic or osmotic pressure pushing in to the bloodstream across the uh, endothelium here is only 25. It's 25 throughout. All right, so the tonicity created by the blood, because it has a lot of protein in it, um, the tonicity that's created thereby is uh, is only 25 millimeters of mercury in terms of its uh, osmotic force. So that means that 55 is winning. As long as we have more than 25, the hydrostatic pressure is winning. Okay, so we're out here. And that means that the cells that are out here are getting uh, nourished by water, uh, oxygen, uh, other nutrients, glucose, essential amino acids, vitamins, etc. And then, um, over on this side, 25 is winning because the hydrostatic pressure has dropped to only 10 millimeters of mercury. So right here, we're about even. There's as much coming out as is going back in. Oh, by the time you get here, um, the shift has taken place, and now almost everything is going back in. The cells that are residing in this zone are uh, going to be having their... Um, uh, metabolic uh, waste products removed, hence cleaned. All right, so there's capillaries beginning and starting everywhere throughout this whole region. We're only looking at one of them. So the cells that are over here receiving nutrients are also near the venous end of some capillary bed somewhere, and they're going to be able to give up their um, waste products. Okay. So, um, and we always get to one of these really, um, how shall I say, disturbing pictures at the end of this chapter. In this particular edition, they have this one. The idea here is that we have acute blood loss. What happens when there's acute blood loss? And uh, you can work your way through the chart here, and um, there are some main things. There's compensatory things. Respiration is increasing. Heart rate is increasing because if there's a lower end diastolic volume, then you're going to have to have more heartbeats more stroke volumes for the smaller size of each stroke volume in order to maintain cardiac output. This is something you need to sort of like get into terms with all the time. Um, if you see an increase in heart rate in your patient, you can just almost automatically assume they have a drop in blood pressure. Uh, it's the way the body compensates for a drop in blood pressure is to increase the heart rate. Ultimately, we have all of these signs and symptoms down here 
that are characteristic and uh, with enough blood loss of course we completely lose the patient at that point okay so uh, we'll go on to the next section now